If this isn't the first video that you've watched on Montessori, it probably won't be a big surprise to you that the title, Montessori Toys, has a question mark at the end. If you type Montessori into a search engine, you'll see that one of the options, one of the suggestions that comes up for the rest of the phrase is Montessori Toys. So what is a Montessori toy? Well, depending on how informed you are already, you may know that that's kind of a trick question because there's no such thing as a Montessori toy. If you have already become familiar with the objects that are associated with Montessori education, you'll know that they are Montessori materials, Montessori learning materials, didactic materials, part of the Montessori prepared learning environment, but they are not toys. So why would I do a whole episode on Montessori toys? Because that is a valid question to ask if you're seeking to have a Montessori environment. Which toys are appropriate? There aren't any Montessori toys, and I'm going to suggest that I would prefer not to talk about Montessori-inspired toys either. There are a lot of things that are marketed on the internet or labeled as Montessori-inspired, and I think that's great. I believe that Montessori having inspired so many things that are available for our children and are normal in children's lives in 2015, that is a wonderful thing. But no, just like there are not Montessori inspired shoes, I don't believe there are Montessori inspired toys. Now, it's very appropriate to say that um, a Velcro closure shoe is something that would be Montessori friendly because one of the principles of Montessori education is that we want to support children to do for themselves as much as possible without making things too easy for them all the way from birth on. So for a toddler, learning to tie is not developmentally appropriate. They don't have the manual skills to be able to tie a shoe. So a Velcro shoe is a Montessori friendly style of shoe. In the same way, I believe there are toys that we can style as Montessori friendly. The reason I prefer not to say Montessori inspired is anything that's child sized, you could call it Montessori inspired. If you look at the way that children were expected to fit into adult lives at the turn of the century before Dr. Montessori put her ideas out into the world, you could say that any kind of child-sized furniture is Montessori inspired. Any kind of learning materials that children use with their hands besides a pencil or a chalk and a, a chalkboard are Montessori inspired. And so I think in some ways that's a term that has become so overused and perhaps could be overused even appropriately that it's kind of meaningless. So what we're actually going to talk about in this video is Montessori friendly toys. Now some people may say, well, what's the difference? Well, I believe that Montessori did not address toys or art materials or a lot of other things, children's songs, in very much depth because that wasn't where she found the emphasis needed to be. That ground was kind of covered. And in terms of a school, a specially prepared environment for three to six year olds, or even to some extent for toddlers, toys were not what she found those children were choosing in their special place, in a place prepared just for them to spend time and do what they would most like to do, she found the toys were rejected in favor of the materials that she developed and discovered and just left in the environment after she had placed them in there originally with them having been developed by others previously. So there is a place in every child's life for toys. There's a place in adults' lives for toys. Let's talk about what it might take to be a Montessori-friendly toy. So what do you think? Are these Montessori-friendly toys? Well, neither one were made by Montessori or imagined by Montessori. So how do we talk about that? How do we decide whether or not a toy belongs in the environment of a child that the parents or the, the teachers have decided is going to get the benefit of Montessori parenting or Montessori education. 
Well, let's take a couple, take a look at these. This one is obviously for a very young child. You can see that it's kind of approximates a face because you've got the eyes. You can probably not see quite so well in the video, but maybe with a little bit of, of description, you can tell that these different little rays or, or extensions are different textures. So this is kind of a denim, this is a flannel, this is just a, a, a woven uh, cotton material, this is very satiny, this is a terry cloth, and this is another satiny material. And then there's kind of a fuzziness, um, two different colors. So would this be a Montessori toy, a Montessori friendly toy? It could be. Um, if it were given to a child who was of the age that this would stimulate their development, interest them, and not in any way endanger them, that would be a Montessori friendly toy from my perspective. And the younger the child is, the easier it is in a lot of ways. When a child is very young, the only things they can even deal with are pretty much going to enhance their development. This would be for uh, an infant. And it is a child, it is of a, a situation that, uh, excuse me, it has qualities that would stimulate an infant's tactile sense, uh, manual sense, uh, because we know that infants are sensitive to the human face. The fact that it's got the, the arrangement of eyes that a human face does would probably draw the, the infant's attention to that. Now, is this a real thing? Some of you who are watching probably know that Montessori believed in delaying fantasy for an, until after, about the time the child was five or six. Well, is this a fantasy object? Again, it depends on what we're talking about developmentally. For a child, an infant, they don't know whether it's a fantasy object or not. It doesn't make very much difference. What's important is that it is attractive. It is something that would be able to be explored in a way that's developmentally appropriate for the child. So let's take a look at a few more infant toys. How about a mirror? Be stimulating visually for, for the child. It's metal, so it would be um, safe for the child. So that, to my mind, would be a Montessori-friendly toy. Now, how about these? Well, this has one thing going for it, which is that the sound is a little bit soft. For younger um, children, you, you do want to have sounds that are a little softer. Loud rattles are a little bit hard on their ears, especially if they're holding it and shaking it, because they're probably going to be holding it and shaking it near their ears. But there is something about both of these objects that some parents would have a problem with, which is that they're made of plastic. Now here is one of those places where you do have some things that are not made of plastic that would be safe for an infant to, to manipulate. You'd have to be a little bit careful because it's a little bit easier to have objects like this that might have pieces that could come off and would be unsafe. Some things, such as a teether, that could be put in the freezer if, if, if you want to have something cold for the infant to put on their, their gums. I don't know anything but plastic that would work. So one of the things that you're probably getting is there's not a list. There's not a list of toys that are Montessori friendly for infants or for any other stage. You're going to have to evaluate different qualities of the toys and whether or not they are a fit for what you're looking for to provide for your child. A safe, developmentally appropriate, and definitely not harmful experience is certainly going to be a part of that. One of the things that we talked about in the previous segment is that if a toy is going to be considered Montessori friendly, it needs to do no harm. And before we look at a few other objects and kind of talk about the principles that would be involved with choosing toys that are in alignment with Montessori principles, I do want to take just a moment to talk about electronic toys, specifically iPads, tablets, things like that. I do believe that they fall in the category of an unknown. And the reason that I say that is that with the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations for screen time being very limited for children, for all children, meaning any child, any person under age 18, I think that we have to consider when our children are working with a screen that we don't completely know what's going on in their brains. We 
are just now seeing what's happening with people who grew up with television developmentally. So I am going to suggest that this is a place that I think you should be very conservative and very cautious. And below age two, I think that screens are not appropriate at all. And I think anything above that, if a screen is involved, that you need to be very, very careful and very, very limited. And I don't think it is being radical to have no screen at time at all for children under age six. I think that it's actually a cautious approach. Um, inform yourself and, and make some good decisions about that one. Now, one of the things that Montessori is known for is the idea that fantasy is best left until children have moved into the second plane of development. This happens somewhere around age five or six and usually is somewhat along the same time as, as when they start to lose baby teeth and have, have permanent teeth replace them. And the reason for this is that prior to that, developmentally, usually the child has trouble sorting out real from unreal, has difficulty sorting out if we tell a story about talking dinosaurs, understanding that that is not a real thing that happened now or at some other time. Uh, they also have a hard time understanding now and some other time even because of, of the developmental limitations. But if you're going to take that approach, which I do endorse, I think that you need to be careful and you, you need to, to look at the different toys and things like books that you, you bring into your children's environment. We, we were talking about things for infants. These would be um, fun little infant and toddler books. Now, it does have text that is written in the first person, so it's like the little horse or the little cat are speaking. It says things like, tickle my tummy, or um, I can see in the dark, I have sharp teeth and claws, but it does not have the cat fixing supper. Um, or cooking or you know the horse having a conversation with someone and so you could say that this is being a little bit fantasy oriented because it's got the animals talking but I would say this is completely developmentally appropriate. Now you may look at things like stuffed toys. Um, this could be considered a polar bear. It doesn't have clothes on or something to, to make it more of a fantasy element. I believe that if a child then takes something that has not got fantasy elements built into it and creates fantasy on, on his or her own terms, that that is not a problem. I believe that if a child's in a Montessori environment, in a Montessori learning environment, and they have specific materials that are used for specific purposes, and then they start to fantasize or make those materials into something else, that's an appropriate action to redirect. But if a child is, you know, making a bear do something that bears don't do, I don't think there's any reason to, to worry about that. Now, how about this whole fantasy thing? What, how, how do we approach that? And, and one of the things that I would suggest is that if you can just keep it pretty much cut and dry, that until the child is losing teeth, is, is showing a clear understanding of what's real and what's not real, then what we present to them are things the way that they are in the world. Um, they might be stylized um, or a, a cartoon or, or something, you know, it, it doesn't have to be a real illustration of ladybugs if it's representing ladybugs or doing what ladybugs do. However, if you've got something that is obviously not the way that the real world works. Here we have a little finger puppet that has eyes and a smile, and it sort of looks like the way that it's styled as a puppet, that its little leaves could be arms, and you could do little plays with the flowers talking to one another. I have a whole little set here. And that is something that I probably would not introduce to a child under the age of five or six. Now, because children, after they get to be about five or six, are are very much into um, acting out little stories and plays and, and things, they could certainly have a toy like this and, and have the flowers speak out for us to take care of the earth or, or whatever they wanted to do to, to have their flowers have an imaginary um, time. I think that's just fine. 
So I do think it's important to recognize that even though Montessori believed that fantasy should be confined to the second plane of development or later, and she did believe that fantasy with real elements, so helping use things like a real understanding of the way the universe works to enhance a child's understanding of, uh, of life is a way, is right use of the imagination. It doesn't mean that we can't have fantasy elements there as well. So let's look at a couple of other principles, or, and we'll look at some toys to see whether or not they fit in with the Montessori education, some things for some older children. Now this is a board game. It's a little different kind of a board game. I'm not sure if, if it still looks this way. This is a board game called Harvest Time that is from a, a company called Family Pastimes, and it's a cooperative game. Instead of having little things that you move around a board, you have little plastic pieces, and these are plastic, so we may talk a little bit more about plastic later. You have a colored die, and the die lets you know which of your fruits and vegetables you can harvest. And the goal is to get everyone's garden harvested before winter comes. Now, if the white part of the die comes up, you must put a piece of winter on the board. And if you haven't gotten all the gardens harvested by the time winter comes, then everyone loses because that's the nature of the game. It's a cooperative game. Now this is one of those things that I think is very much in alignment with Montessori principles. It doesn't mean you can't have competitive games. It doesn't mean that you can't have chests and harvest time on, on your shelf together. That could be very, very appropriate. Now, let's take a look at another toy. Now, remember how we said that there are no Montessori toys? Well, but this is a learning thing. Could this be a Montessori-friendly um, material or a Montessori-inspired material? Yes and no. Um, it's a toy, because <laughs> it's definitely not a Montessori material. And I would suggest that it is a little bit wrong-headed. It is not doing one of the primary things that we know Montessori learning materials should do, which is isolate the difficulty. Is this a set of snails, or is it a four? Is this a pair of grasshoppers, or is it a two? It's very unclear, and so I would suggest this is something you would want to skip entirely. It's neither a Montessori-friendly game nor an appropriate learning material. Well, besides talking about what toys shouldn't be, let's talk about some things that they should be. Well, one is that they definitely can have a learning element to them. Even though this is a toy, it's, it's a, a fishing game. So what you have is a little fishing pole that's got a magnet on the, the bottom of your little hook end. If it were a real fishing pole, it would have a hook. And then you have a set of little fish that have magnets on them. And if you get it over the magnet, then you catch your fish. Now, for an adult, there's not much challenge, and it's a pretty boring game. For a child who is still learning to develop manually, this could be a lot of fun. Now, it has some other good things about it. It's natural materials, for the most part. The, the fish and the... Um, poles or wood, there's a string. I've got it in a little basket that's got a little cloth covering and is a natural basket. Now, why do we want to have natural materials in our children's environments? There's a lot of reasons. One is because Montessori teaches a, a, a custodian approach to the earth, that it is our responsibility to take care of the earth. Now, that doesn't mean that everything the child does has to be about something socially responsible, but where it can be, it's a good thing. There is also evidence that the feel, not the kinesthetic feel, but the energetic feel of objects that are made from petroleum products are of a different quality than natural objects. Some people say that's a bunch of baloney, and other people say I can feel it with my own um, body and I can tell that that's a legitimate principle. So should you have plastic things in your child's environment? Well, I think it's a little bit of a, of a judgment call. 
um, what's your budget, how many children are you needing to provide toys for, Plastic tends to be cheaper. I think that this entire set was probably a dollar at a dollar store. That's one reason why, why I have it, and I won't go through all the reasons why I needed a few more things for a few more children to use. But this toy, despite the fact that it's plastic, has a quality that I suggest that you look for in toys, which is open-ended. Now, this is one of the reasons why, if you are going to buy plastic toys. I suggest that you buy ones that are well made. Um, Legos, I actually think are fine as long as they don't have a plan for what you're supposed to build with them. You can see the way that this toy is presented is it's in a little tray. It's got all of its pieces. It doesn't tell you to make anything with it. You might decide these are wheels. You might not. That's an open-ended toy. Now, let's look at something. These are all plastic pieces. But what are they plastic pieces for? They're plastic pieces to use with Play-Doh, which you can make with kitchen ingredients on your stove with food, food ingredients yourself that are, are pretty natural and healthy for your children to deal with. Now, could you have wooden things for them to manipulate their Play-Doh with, Play with? Absolutely, you could. But I'm going to suggest that if you already have things like this in your home, that it's not absolutely necessary to just get rid of all uh, unnatural materials. If you've got some shapes for them to use on the fridge, that's an open-ended uh, game. Now, <laughs> I couldn't resist in this segment showing you this. Now, this is an all-natural uh, toy. I'm going to show you the toy itself in a minute. But if you take a look at this packaging and you think, hmm, something's a little bit strange there. You'd be absolutely correct, because the people who made this packaging decided to put a little girl's face on a grown-up woman's body in a wedding gown. I have no idea why. I would never put the packaging where a child could see it, but the toy itself is a little bit interesting. It's a tea set, and it is a ceramic tea set. So it meets one of our qualifications. That's a natural material. One of the things that you, you may also have, have heard is that, that Montessori believes in giving children breakable things. Now, this is definitely focused toward fantasy. This would be too small for a child to drink out of. It would be for dolls or stuffed animals or whatever to have a tea party. So would you put it in the environment? I might. Um, to be honest with you, I haven't given it to children. I've used it for miniature objects. So in my object boxes, I have a plate, and I have the, uh, and this is a plate for the children to spell out with the movable alphabet. So that's the reason that I actually purchased it, not to give it out as a toy. But I'm going to suggest that as you're evaluating the toys, look at what you may want to be putting in your home or using in your home that you already have rather than adding more toys. So if your children are interested in pouring, if they're interested in tea, um, if they're interested in making beverages, teach them to do that. Give them the practical life lessons, which are very much a part of a Montessori school, but also should be a part of a home environment. Give them the options to do that rather than having a pretend tea party with their dolls. Now, I'm not saying don't have a pretend tea set, but I am saying make the real experience available for sure. That's one of the things that are definitely part of the Montessori experience. So even as you're making your best choices about toys and, and what kinds of toys should be in your children's environment, think about the principles, think about what else you might want to add rather than a toy, and think about how you're going to manage it. Now, I am going to start putting, in conjunction with the, the episodes of our television show, blog posts that will give some links to things to give you more ideas. Um, Community Playthings is one of the companies that I just think is marvelous in terms of a source for toys, for unit blocks, for wooden unit blocks. Meets every qualification for a developmentally appropriate toy for, for younger children. And so I will have some of those sources available. In a future segment, what we will do is also talk about 
how do you manage a child's personal environment, including the toys for the family? Whether it's one child, a, a group of children, how do you make it so that you're not the one taking care of the toys, the person that they belong to takes care of them? And we'll deal with that in another episode.